Hey everyone, today's species spotlight is a very special one. It's quite near and dear to me. Today I'm going to be talking about an animal that is truly from another time and I'm going to do my best not to, you know, step on my soapbox a little too much. Today we're talking about the American alligator. Now, alligators and crocodilians specifically have been around for a long, long time. Crocodilians, at least that we would consider recognizable crocodilians, evolved somewhere around 200 million years ago, which means they're older than the rings of Saturn. And throughout that entire time, by and large, they have remained unchanged for quite a few different reasons that I'll get to in just a minute. Now, the American alligator, or Alligator Mississippiensis, was first described by science back in 1801 by French researchers and explorers. Later they were, and then they were described as crocodilus, and then later they were reevaluated taxonomy wise as alligator mississippiensis. Now they are called alligator mississippiensis because they are found in the southeastern part of the United States, basically from eastern Texas all the way up to parts of South Carolina, and they are found throughout parts of the Mississippi River, their tributaries all the way throughout that range, including parts, and then also including lagoons, ponds, golf course waterways, and in some cases in South Florida, McDonald's drive throughs Now, there are actually two different species of alligators. There's American alligators that we're talking about, and then the Chinese alligator, which is a lot smaller, obviously found over on the other side of the world. Now, out of the 27 species of crocodilians, Alligators belong to a family or a clade called Allig Alligator Day, and in that, that includes alligators and caiman. American alligators, or gators, are the second largest species of that family, the largest of which being the black caiman down found in South America. Now, American alligators are absolutely amazing and remarkable animals. They are born in little built-up nests, in large collections of eggs that are hatched out in these tiny, adorable little, less than 10 inch long, like striped little baby lizards that make this really cool distress noise that kind of goes, oh, oh. I've been told that's a pretty good impression. Don't hate me on that too much. Now, that is actually a distress call that they will give that will actually get the attention of, it has been recorded, any adult alligator, not just ones that they're related to. So if you're out murking around down in Florida, Louisiana, Texas, and you hear that, maybe get out of the water. Now, when again, when they're hatched, they're these tiny, cute, little adorable babies that are this kind of bright black with these really cool striped yellowish white stripes. And as they get older, that essentially fades away and becomes this kind of olive green to black coloration that is the adult alligators. And they go through a couple other changes too. So they also, when you look at alligators, and alligators are well known for losing their teeth and those really nice, sharp conical teeth. When they're babies, they're a lot more needle-like. And that essentially has to do with the type of prey that they're eating when they are little. They eat a lot more insects and very small, fast-moving fish, and those help kind of grab onto those things, kind of like gharials as adults. Then when they get older, they're a little bit heavier, they're denser, they're thicker, and they're more conical shaped. And that's for grabbing and holding on to those larger prey items that includes basically everything under the sun in their range. Because as adults, they are true apex predators. As babies, not so much. Basically, everything eats them. From birds to larger gators to indigo snakes. Now, as I said before, as adults, they are apex predators. Alligators are huge reptiles. There is sexual dimorphism, which means that males typically are larger than females, where the males will actually average somewhere around 13 feet long and well over 800 pounds. Females being a little bit smaller, and I say smaller, usually typically in that eight to nine foot range. Now there's a lot of conjecture about how large they actually can or have grown. Now I get into a lot of trouble when I throw out these numbers, but back in 1890, there was a 19 foot long or just over alligator that was caught and pulled onto shore. They haven't been able to really verify that because back in 1890, there weren't real great ways of dragging a alligator out of the swamp and then accurately measure, measuring it and recording it properly or officially. So it gets a little bit more muddy and conjectury from there, but essentially it's around 16 feet was the largest bull alligator ever caught and measured officially. Again, that is what I can find verifiably. I know I get into a lot of trouble again, like I always say, but this is what I could find in general. 
Now, as I said previously, the very beginning of the video, that these guys have remained essentially unchanged for millions and millions of years. And that is because they have a lot of really cool adaptations. So in addition to, you know, having the teeth fall out and constantly be replaced, they are built for success. They have the eyes on the top of their heads, so even then that 16 foot long alligator can essentially remain entirely unseen from the surface of water with just their eyes and their nose sticking above the, uh, above the surface. And then once they go underwater, they have a bunch of other really cool things where they can close their nostrils. They have a meticulating membrane that allows them to actually be able to keep their eye covered and their external eyelids open so they can close their nose and open their eye underwater and look around and see. They can hold their breath for extended periods of time. They have what is essentially a little flange or a flap at the back of their throats that actually prevents water from going into their mouth so they can actually open their mouths underwater as well, and it helps them to be able to keep water or whatever it is they're holding onto from going into their throats. Like, so for instance, they grab something really big, they pull it underwater, they can sit there and hold it underwater while it essentially their prey item drowns and they can just close that flange and they can just hang out underwater while that happens and lets water do the work for them. They also have a very large, powerful tail. It's really thick and muscular. It also helps store fat so they don't need to eat for very long and extended periods of time. They have very large web feet that aids in them being able to burrow. It aids in them being able to crawl out and they can actually walk. They essentially have two walks on land, an upright and a low down to where you can actually see all those videos of the golf courses, those big 10 plus foot long alligators just walking along golf courses and places down in Florida. And then they also, when it comes to like their skin, so the alligators were considered an, where they were an endangered species back in the 60s because of they were hunted for their skin, just like a lot of animals were, and, and to be completely honest with you. And the underside is very desired. That's essentially what they would use a lot of their stuff for, for most of it. And yeah, there are plenty of examples where they would use the whole animal. But the top of their skin acts as essentially body armor, in addition to just being a very tough, powerfully built, sturdy animal. Under their scales, there's actually pieces of bone, and those bones are actually called osteoderms. Those, and that is part of their, it's not attached to the skeleton, so if you're ever to like take away all the skin, you would see the skeleton of the alligator, and then individually all those little osteoderms that essentially act as body armor for those alligators. Most species, all species of crocodilians have them, some more or less, and, the species of many, and then in the case of many species of caiman, they actually have them on their underbellies as well. Now, obviously, I'm in Colorado, and in most places in general, not only in the United States, but I'm assuming around the world, you can't actually keep most crocodilians as pets for a lot of good reasons that if you hadn't gotten by this point, I will elaborate a little bit further down. So, how am I so passionate and why do I know so much about alligators? Well, it's because down here in Southern Colorado, there's actually a wildlife park called Colorado Gators, where most of this film was taken. So Colorado Gators was established as a tilapia farm and it still functions as that today. You can buy fish from there if you ever decide to visit. And they decided to get a couple alligators because back in the 80s, it was legal to do so. There hadn't been regulations put forth yet. And they got alligators as essentially nat natural garbage disposals. So that way they weren't throwing fish carcasses everywhere or something were to happen. It's just, it takes care of itself. Well, they ended up getting famous for that to the point where now Fish and Wildlife Services, both in Colorado and around the country, will bring in alligators that were being, and other species of crocodilians. They have Nile crocodiles, Siamese crocodiles multiple species of caiman, as well as other reptiles that are brought to them from around the country that were being kept either illegally or not well, or something happened to a facility where the facility had closed down, they need somewhere to go. So right now they essentially act as not only a functioning tilapia farm, but a wildlife park, a rehabilitation center, and a rescue facility for multiple species of reptiles. They have a bunch of animals there and they do their best to absolutely give the animals there their best quality of life. While there, you can see all these different fun, uh, different ones. You can learn about all the really cool stuff about alligators and other species of reptiles, as well as you can actually help aid in alligator aid classes. Back in the 90s, it was called alligator wrestling. It's not the best connotation. So they changed it to alligator aid classes, where you, in fact, do learn about alligators, their body language, stuff about them, and to help aid pulling the larger ones out of the water and inspecting them visibly 
for injuries because alligators will injure themselves and each other, unfortunately. And so in that case, that's how I have more hands-on experience with alligators. Now, all of this come into mind. Here's where I get on my little soapbox, penny for my thoughts. I am not one to say that, ignore the iguanas, that no one should be able to keep X, Y, and Z reptile. I really don't like to do that. However, crocodilians, in my opinion, and specifically alligators and crocodiles really shouldn't be kept by private individuals without access or being able to house them in a true wildlife facility or rehabilitation center or, or a zoo lot or anything like that. Private individuals probably shouldn't be keeping alligators. I know that there are people watching this video right now who live in states that probably picked up less than $100 a baby alligator and are raising them up like a little smooth-fronted or wedgehead caiman. However, I have yet to see any private individual show me their adult alligator enclosure, probably because they don't have one. They are not able to actually house a 13, 14 foot plus bull alligator as an adult, given their full size. Even other YouTubers out there, I'm not gonna mention names, some of them do really great work, some of them have done really good work, some of them have not done, some of them don't set the best example, either way, they do in fact have much more the ability to house them properly with more money, with more space, with more knowledge, and even they will admit that they could be doing better. So at least I will give them that much credit. But you, most people really do not have the ability to give them thousands and thousands and thousands of filtered heated water plus plenty of area for them to come in and out of land, give them varied diets, all of that stuff. So that is why I do not believe that alligators make the best pet reptiles. Now, stepping down from there. All that to say that I don't think alligators are bad reptiles. They are absolutely amazing. They are the pinnacle of survival and streamlined predatory evolution. They are amazing. They are highly intelligent, very adaptable. They, they're, they're, they're so great. When I say they are intelligent, I mean they remember people on an individual basis. They can see different colors to some degree. They remember times. They remember patterns where certain people or animals will come during different parts of the day, different parts of the year, and they will remember where to be or not to be during those periods of time. They're capable of climbing. Yes, all crocodilians, but alligators especially, it seems to be, are very and quite capable of climbing trees and fences. And the American alligator being from a subtropical area like Florida and parts further north of the range where it actually gets quite cold in the winter, have the ability actually to survive under the ice where they will lower their body temperature down and all of their metabolic functions and they will stick just their nose above the ice and they will actually survive in the ice. And I'm not talking about just here in Colorado where they have geothermal wells, which is why in the middle of winter, the water is actually warmer here than it is in parts of Florida, but in parts of Texas, Louisiana, South Carolina, where it can get really cold and it will ice over. Alligators are well known and documented to be able to do that. Just absolutely amazing animals. However, I just don't think they make the best pets, but I do just want to talk about how cool crocodilians and alligators are specifically. Absolutely amazing. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. I hope I didn't get too preachy there at the end. If anyone has the ability to go see alligators in the wild or at any of the really nice wildlife parks and places throughout the United States, if you ever have a chance to come to Colorado, you wanna check out Colorado Gators, I do recommend it. It's a really great place. These guys are amazing. A wealth of knowledge that I have learned so much from and continue to learn from, and they continue to learn as well. If you guys want to check out the full Species Spotlight playlist, it's right here at the at the end of all of the different videos. If you want to click on that, it helps my click-through rate, lets YouTube know that I exist, pushes me forward. Um, if you can, like and subscribe. I do appreciate it. Questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, um, let me know down in the comments. And also, if you can, go check out um, Colorado Reptile Educators. I'm part of another group um, that involves Lori Torini, Troy Bumgarner. We're doing our best to put out nice science evidence-based reptile keeping out there for everybody in the community, not just Colorado. Link for that is down below in the description of this and all of the videos that are gonna be coming out henceforth. If you can go check that out, there's also an audio version of that available up on a couple of the other different podcast uh, platforms. I'm having some issues with that at the moment, but I'm working on that. But if you can, check that out. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed
today's video. Hope everyone's having a great day and we'll check you next time.